Bill Spitzeri has been an amateur astronomer for 50 years and is a member of HAS and is also a member of uh, an astronomy club near Chicago for over 36 years and counting. He served there as president for two years and has held other offices. So Bill, when I'm done here, if you're interested, you know, you can always run for president of HAS as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Bill is now a retired software analyst and grandpa of three. His main astro astronomy activities these days is teaching children about our universe. And uh, he's spent a, a lot of time teaching us about a lot of things related to astronomy, especially as astronomy travels. And tonight is no different. So we'll be going through the Galileo Museum with Bill tonight. So Bill, I'd like to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Don Sully uh, invited me to talk on this topic. I, by the way, of that previous scream, I didn't know my picture was going to be so big. Okay. <laughs> but uh, that's fine. Uh, all right. Uh, I should share my screen now. Is that correct? Yes, please. All right. Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. Now, do you see the uh, pink screen with Galileo on it? We do. Absolutely. And is and, that, uh, oh, go ahead. Is that filling the screen? It certainly is. Okay. Okay. And All I was right. just going to let Bill, before you started, if anybody has any yes. questions that they want to ask of you, go ahead and place those in the chat feature that we have in Zoom, and we'll get to those at the end. Let everybody come off of mute and ask those uh, questions directly to you once you're done. Oh, that's fine. I can make up answers. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the topic is the Galileo Museum, and uh, I will begin by saying, you know, they make a museum about you when people, big shots, say things like you see on the right there. Stephen Hawking saying that he uh, uh, bears more of the responsibility for the birth of modern science than anybody. That's saying something. And then Einstein said he's the father of modern science. So when they say things like that, they make a, um, uh, they make a museum about you, all right? Uh, so the reason I was at the museum, I, 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 well, my ancestors, many of my ancestors are in Italy, and uh, there's a picture of, of some of them on the, on the left. I could show you a lot more pictures, but they'd all be the same. They're always eating and drinking all the time. And that the view in the background there is the view from their front door. So this, they live up in the mountains of no place in it, southern Italy. And uh, it's, uh, let me tell you, if you get a chance when, when we can do that thing called travel, uh, you got to go to Italy, and I could go on for hours about that. So that's why I was in Italy. And uh, so there's the map on the left. Now, my family is down in the, in the toe of the boot, uh, Calabria over there. Uh, but when we visited, we uh, went to the Salerno and Naples and Rome and Florence and Venice and many other cities. I'm telling you, it's just the food, the history, the art, the architecture is fantastic. So if you look up uh, towards the north there, you'll see Florence. That's, we're gonna, that's where the museum is. We're going to be talking about that. But we're also going to be talking about Venice, which is up in the northeast. By the way, can you see my cursor at all when I'm moving it? Yes. You we can. Do. Okay, that's yes. good. And then there you see the museum. I took a picture of it on the right. Okay. Uh, uh, FYI, the museum, I went there uh, the first time in 2011, as you can see on the photograph. But they only started calling it the Galileo Museum about two years before when they acquired some very specific Galileo uh, items. Before that, it was just the Italian Science History Museum. But they got so much Galileo stuff, which doesn't surprise me, uh, that they changed the name of the museum there. Okay. So I'm not supposed to, um, this isn't a presentation about Galileo, but if I'm going to talk about his museum, I got to talk about him somewhat. All right. I'm going to try to go through this quick. You know, he did a lot of science. Uh, observationally, Jupiter's moons, and we know about that, and we'll talk about them. But when they name the moons after you, Galilean moons, you know, you, you're a good observational guy. Astrophysics, he was a proponent of uh, Copernican uh, heliocentric systems. Uh, specifically by his observations of Venus's phases. In physics, he made the statement that uh, all the laws are the same for all moving bodies that are moving in a constant velocity, which is not insignificant in terms of physics. And of course, it's closely related to Einstein's relativity. On the subject of the scientific method, he said, if you're going to, if you want to learn, if you want to gain knowledge, you got to do science. And science means math, observation, and experimentation. You got to do that stuff. Otherwise, you're just kidding around. 
And he was an inventor, and you'll see more of that uh, in the stuff from the museum. He invented a kind of a thermometer, a scale that uses water. Uh, of course, he increased the telescope to 30 power. So he was definitely an inventor guy. But he did a lot of stuff. And, I'm, and again, I don't want to focus just on Galileo himself, but I'm going to talk about the museum. But first, I'm going to give you what I will call a summary of his life. And believe me, this is a summary. So if you got one, fasten your seatbelt. Here we go. He's born in 1564. His long name in red there, I'm just going to call him Galileo. You can uh, learn how to pronounce that if you like. In 74, he moved to Florence, 75 to 78. He was in, you know, like high school and junior college kind of. Uh, 1580, he, he, he enrolls in the University of Medicine in Pisa. In medicine, his doctor wanted him to be a, his, his father wanted him to be a doctor. He then took a geometry class and he changed his major to math and science. They called it natural philosophy back then. My guess is he changed his math before he told his father. I'm just guessing on that. That's just the way that usually happens. Uh, and then 1586, he invented that uh, thermometer I mentioned and then that scale of balance. Uh, 1588, he was teaching art in Florence. Why art? Because of his the geometry that he learned, he was teaching perspective in art, which was a Renaissance thing uh, where the art changed using a geometric perspective. One year later, he's in charge of the mathematics department at the university. Uh, for several years, then he's teaching geometry, mechanics, astronomy, uh, fundamental so physics uh, of motion. He observed a supernova with his telescope during that time period and many other things. 1609, specifically, he used his telescope for his groundbreaking observations of the moon and Venus, Jupiter and its moons. We'll be talking about that. Uh, the next year, he published The Starry Messenger, which is where he discussed his 1609 observations. Uh, in, in a few years after that, he actually observed Saturn. Couldn't tell what the rings were, didn't understand the ring, these uh, things on the side of Saturn, but he saw them. Uh, and he observed the Milky Way, which I wish I could talk about that for half an hour. That's uh, amazing observations he made there. 1612, he actually observed Neptune, but he didn't know what it was, and sunspots, which we'll be talking more about that later. And then, of course, he starts to get into trouble. You know, these guys, he's a troublemaker. 1613, he has to defend heliocentrism, which, again, wasn't his original idea. It was Copernicus, but he was publishing it. After his uh, observation of Venus, he was saying, oh, this is, where the, this is how the universe is designed, put the sun in the center, and the Earth goes around it. And, uh, you know, some people have no sense of humor about that, right? <clears throat> so the, in 1616, he's in Rome. Def uh, defending himself against the Inquisition. And they said, well, you know what? It's okay for you to talk about that, but don't say that's the way it is. Just say that's the way it could be. All right. So that's how he left it with them. Uh, 1617, he observes a double star Mizar. I don't know if he was the first guy to discover a double star system, but uh, that's what he did in 1617. Uh, 1623, he publishes a book called The Assayer, which is a, 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 less, a manifesto on how you should conduct science, uh, as we discussed earlier, math, observations, experimentation, not just sitting around and thinking about it, okay? And then you might be able to uh, identify with this. He suffered through a pandemic, 1629 to 1631, which uh, he survived, obviously, but uh, it really slowed down his publication, communication with other scientists, as, again, you might be familiar with. Now, because of his problems with the Inquisition in 1632, he published uh, the dialogue concerning the two chief, two chief world systems. This was, instead of him saying heliocentricity is the way it is, he, his book, The Dialogue, had a conversation between two guys, and one said heliocentricity was correct, and the other guy said it wasn't. Now, he made the guy who said it wasn't correct to be a real idiot, and the, 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 the uh, skeptic, the... Um, Sarcasm wasn't lost on the church. They were not happy with that at all. It made them look like uh, idiots, right? Uh, but anyway, um, so he, in 1633, he's back defending himself uh, against about heliocentrism. And uh, it didn't go so well. It was threatened with torture. He was uh, uh, sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. And when that happened, as it says in the red there, 
he allegedly muttered the rebellious phrase, pour se muove, Italian, and in English, that means, and still it moves. In other words, yeah, you can arrest me, you can threaten me, you can stop me from publishing, but the earth still moves around the sun. Whether he really said that or not is uh, a lot of people say he didn't. Uh, I got a bumper sticker that says that, a pour se muove. I, I'm sure many of you do too, right? Uh, anyway, um, in 1638, unfortunately, for whatever reason, he went blind. I always uh, suspected was that his solar observations that did that, but who knows. And in 1642, he was buried in a very small grave because, you know, he was persona non grata in the church back then. So he didn't make it into a big grave, which we'll look at later. Now, so I'm sorry. Uh, again, I, I tried to go through that quickly. Uh, if you want to learn more, I just finished this uh, four DVD lecture series extremely detailed about his life. So it's 12 lectures, 30 minutes each, six hours, very detailed. The uh, presenter is uh, a Jesuit brother named Guy Consolmagno, which who many of you have known and met. He's a Vatican astronomer. He's in charge of the observatory for the Vatican in Rome. Uh, this came out in 2014, but you know there hasn't been a lot of changes about Galileo since then. So if you look at this learn25.com, you can get, I highly recommend these uh, DVDs. Also, that's about his life. If you want to get into his, what he published, there is this book. It's called On the Shoulder of Giants. It was put together by Stephen Hawking. Uh, it came out in 2002. It's 1,200 pages. So again, fasten your seatbelts. 236 pages about Galileo. Now, it's not just about him. It's his actual published works. OK, it is extremely detailed with a lot of mathematics and geometry. But if that's what you want to get into, God bless you. I, I did my best with that book. And as you can tell by the pictures, it's not just him. It's Copernicus, uh, Galileo, Kepler, Newton and Einstein, uh, the, the people, the giants, uh, according to Stephen Hawking. And, you know, that's a rogues gallery of uh, scientists anyway. So if you want to learn more about Galileo's work, I would recommend that. Good luck for you. Now, I told you he was buried in a small grave, but then later in the 1700s, his followers, the guys who really appreciated his work, got his grave moved from the small grave in Florence to this absolutely stunning uh, tomb at the church you see in the lower right-hand corner, the Basilica of uh, Santa Croce in Florence. And uh, let me tell you, when they bury you in a place like this, you know you've kind of made it. Well, it's all after the fact, but you made it. Uh, so you see him in the middle and the two muses, the ladies on the side. I got some close-up pictures on the left. You see him with, of course, a telescope. On the right, you see the lady with the wardrobe malfunction holding up a, a document, which I think is either astronomical or ge geometric. I'm not sure. And of course, underneath Galileo on the left, if you look down in that the gray oval, you can see what he was very famous for, Jupiter and the four moons. And then in the center picture, you see a close-up of the planet Jupiter, and it's got that weird symbol on it. And many of you may know that is just this official ancient symbol that has been used for Jupiter for centuries. And I always wondered where, how they came to it. And that's because the round part and the horizontal line is the Greek letter uh, for Z, the first letter in Zeus, which is uh, the Greek version of uh, Jupiter, right? And then the vertical line through it means it's an abbreviation. So in other words, they're saying this is just the first letter of the name of Zeus. And that's how Jupiter got its uh, funny symbol. Saturn has an equally funny one. I don't know the story behind that, but you can look that up, I suppose. So um, his followers got him put into a real nice tomb. Now, the museum. Uh, this may shock you, but there's a lot of telescopes in the Galileo Museum, okay? On the left, you see a couple of Galileos, all right? On the right, you see a whole bunch of uh, some, I think the two on the bottom are Galileos, and the rest of them are contemporary telescopes, showing you how they were made back in those 1600s. On the left-hand picture, you see that the device um, uh, surrounded in ivory. I'll talk more about that. Well, no, I won't talk. I'll talk about it now. Uh, no, uh, soon. I'll talk more about that. But if you got your February um, issue of Astronomy Magazine, page uh, page uh, 47, where uh, they talk about the most important astronomers, 
they show the picture of this uh, item here with the ivory around it. And I will tell you what that is, but you can see a little story about it in astronomy magazine. Uh, here's a close up of Galileo's actual astronomy, uh, excuse me, his actual telescopes. Uh, these he made his uh, famous observations of 1609. And uh, as you can see, you know, by our standards, that ain't much, but uh, he, he accomplished uh, some things with it, right? And uh, if you see, you can see the eyepiece here, and, uh, or I'm not sure if that's the, I'm pretty sure that's the objective. And that white area around the objective lens was there. Of course, these are refractors uh, with lenses. And uh, he put that white collar around it to eliminate the chromatic aberration that you frequently get uh, with kind of ordinary lenses, okay? Which is why Isaac Newton um, came up with re reflectors, right? I believe that's why he put those uh, collars around there. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, you know, that's what, is, that's what he did his groundbreaking observations with. So maybe you don't need to get a 36th century, okay? I'm just saying, give it a thought. Uh, here's another one, and look at the way they're decorated. Again, uh, the lenses are small, uh, but they're beautifully decorated. I don't know what material they made those out of. Were they were they a wooden tube or some sort of pressed paper or paper mache or something? I'm not sure, but uh, that's what they looked like in the early 1600s. Now, here we are with the device uh, that is surrounded in ivory that we saw later. So this is the objective lens that was in the telescope or one of his telescopes that he used in his 1609, 1610 observations. It's only an inch and a half across, not much, but obviously after his death, uh, people realized the significance of it and they framed it uh, beautifully in ivory and uh, obviously very intricately carved. And uh, there is a crack in it. And it says that they say at the museum that it was created at a later date so it was probably in uh, good condition when he made his observations, right? Although doggone it, he was so good. You give him half a lens, he probably could change the world with it. Um, so uh, many other telescopes, like I told you of various designs, again, it used to be the Italian Science Museum. And so uh, there are many, many telescopes, very uh, various designs. And that uh, that's me standing over there just for uh, scale. Um, a lot of wooden tubes, many, many of them. Now, we talked about his solar observations. Uh, you know, back in them days, uh, the people were starting to use telescopes. Uh, forget that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so this is how he did his solar observations. You, you take the room you, with a window. You pull the curtains closed. You put a little hole in the curtains. You stick your telescope through the hole in the curtains. Of course, it's got to be facing the sun. And then you, you build this uh, wooden box device you see in the center there. And in that device and the back of the device, you have a screen, I'm assuming like a white board. And, and if, you look at this, if you look at the screen, it can be moved back and forth on that center piece of wood to get the focus properly. And so you can focus an image of the sun on there. And the big deal, again, obviously, it's just a, a regular, he's looking at visible light. And so he's going to see sunspots. And uh, this is how he did it. And, uh, uh, and, and it's fine. It's, so he turned the entire room into a camera, so to speak, he didn't have photographic paper or a CCD over there, he just had a white board. But um, that's the, he, the entire room became a camera. And I found it interesting when I first went to Italy and I learned Italian that the Italian word for room is camera. So I'm thinking there's no coincidence. They saw that this is how they, uh, the first cameras were and the, room for, and the word for room is camera. I believe they originally called them camera obscuras. Okay, way back when cameras were first invented, but that's how he observed sunspots. So this is how he could observe them and then in this picture, you can see how he recorded them. As long as he was projecting them on that white screen, he was able to take, I don't know, a quill pen of some sort, I suppose, in this early 1600s. Um, uh, anyway, and uh, he could trace out the sunspots as he saw them. And you can see four days worth. And obviously, 
uh, you can watch the sunspots move across the uh, disk of the sun. And, you know, back in those days, people would say, oh, those aren't on the sun, uh, obviously, because the sun is perfect. So it can't possibly have spots. And then he said, watch this. And you wait a couple of days and the same spots come around from the other side of the sun. And he said, they're on the sun. They're not in the atmosphere. OK, so that was another groundbreaking discovery uh, that he made with uh, perhaps an amazing invention for his time. But uh, it looked kind of simple from our perspective, an easy way to show it. Um, and here is, I'm going to try to describe this to you, just some of his genius, in my opinion. Okay. So, you know, again, he's, he's all about math, numbers, observations, and recording your observations. So he's observing Jupiter, as we know, and he wants to record what he sees. So he invented this thing called the micrometer, <clears throat> an accessory for his telescopes. Now, if you look at the picture on, uh, in the middle, you'll see it's just a wooden ring with a wooden stick attached to it with a scale on it with equal, uh, you know, uh, uh, equal distant lines on that scale. Now that wooden ring, as you see, fits over the tube of the telescope. Okay. And because it just slides over the tube, it can slide back and forth. Now, in the right hand picture, you'll see what he sees when he uses the micrometer. And with his right eye, he's making an observation in this case of the planet Jupiter. And he sees what the diameter is of Jupiter in his eyepiece. And then he slides the micrometer up and down the tube of the telescope um, until he, with his left eye, he sees that the, uh, the diameter of Jupiter is equal to the distance between two of those lines. Okay, the, for, in other words, if the micrometer is further away, the lines look closer to each other as they get closer, they, there's more distance between them. And so he was able to quantitatively, numerically, uh, measure his observations of Jupiter. And not just of the planet, but as you'll see later, the, the four moons around Jupiter, he could measure their distances away from the disk of Jupiter. And, you know, Maybe some of you guys whip this together in your garage too, but I thought this was genius. Uh, you know, he doesn't have anybody to go to to ask to how do you do this stuff. He just figured it out on his own, and um, I, I I just was amazed when I learned. This is a uh, images for, uh, from the museum. They actually had a movie that showed you how it works. Uh, here is another one of his inventions, which had virtually nothing to do with astronomy, but I have to show it. Uh, it's his uh, so-called geometric military compass, 1597. It is an analog computer in the 1500s, right? Now you see it has three basic parts. It has the two straight legs uh, standing on the ground. It has those, those clever little legs on the side that help it to stand up. And then it has the, uh, shall we say, a uh, quarter of a circle between the two legs. And on those three pieces, there are six, there are 11 different scales, numerical scales of, of various units of measure, okay? And those scales are carved on the front and the back of different scales on the front and, and different scales on the back of those three parts. And with them, uh, you can make at least what I saw, 16 different mathematical calculations with this device. He made a lot of money with this stuff. The military loved this stuff. You could, uh, the big deal with the military, they actually had firearms back then, primitive firearms, and it will tell you what angle to put a cannon to make it the, the projectile go a certain distance, okay? It can tell you how tall an object is at a, a far away, uh, kind of basic trigonometry. Uh, how deep a hole is if you can't actually measure how deep the, the hole is. And, you know, that's the simple stuff. He, many, many calculations. So he, he had many of these made and he, he sold them for a lot of uh, florins or lira or whatever it was back in the 1600. And, uh, but he, he uh, knew, well, he sold uh, what you see on the right, maybe the world's first computer manual. Um, uh, yeah, and I thought if you have a DOS manual, you think you have the first one. No, this was the first one. 
And uh, he published these in his home. I'm not exactly sure how, but that's what he said. And in the manual, he does not include a diagram of the thing, of the uh, device. He says, oh, uh, he doesn't want people making them. He says, oh, you want the manual? Buy the device, which was for big money, and you'll get the manual that teaches you how to use it, okay? So uh, he didn't want to, he, no drawings to prevent knockoffs, okay? So uh, again, an analog computer and the first uh, computer manual. Now, I'm going to try to describe this to you. I don't know how many people have seen this before, but this, this is at the museum, and it absolutely blew my mind. It's, uh, he's making his observations of Jupiter. And again, he is Mr. Math. He's Mr. Geometry, Mr. Quantitative, OK? So he, he developed and then another analog computer, which is called the Jova Lobby. I'm going to try to describe this a little bit quickly here. And then there's going to be a, like a two minute video that that the museum provides that tells you how it works. So, all right. So you see the big circle on top. And in the middle of that circle, I labeled Jupiter. Then there's the four concentric circles, which are the moon, the orbits of the four moons, right? And you see these vertical lines in the big circle, and each of those lines are separated by the radius of Jupiter, okay? So this is a way of measuring uh, Jupiter space, shall we say, from his perspective. Uh, uh, the smaller circle on the bottom is the orbit of Earth around the sun with the sun in the middle, and this little peg it, it, over here that is marked uh, Earth, that's Earth. And uh, this little circle can be rotated around. You just grab the peg and you move it around. And then when you move it around, as you can see, the peg is in this slot in this long arm, and it actually moves the upper circle too. Okay? Are you with me on this? Uh, the uh, All the numbers on the side are just tables. Uh, I think they're in Latin. Uh, that talk about the, the motions of the four moons, okay? Uh, oh, and the purpose of the circle on the bottom is because he knows about, you know, he knew uh, the word was out, the earth goes around the sun. And so he knew the orbit was big. And so he knew that as the earth moves, it will change uh, numerically, quantitatively, your observations of the moons of Jupiter, because you'll be looking from a different location. So he wanted to make all of his observations recorded based on this of observing them from the sun's perspective to get rid of the parallax of the uh, orbit of the earth. Okay. I, I don't know if that's a good description, but we're going to go to the next screen where let the museum tell you how this works. In January 1610, while exploring the heavens with his telescope, so I stopped that to ask to confirm, can everybody hear that uh, a narrator okay? We can, Bill. Very good. I'm going to go back and start it over. Here we go. In January 1610, while exploring the heavens with his telescope, Galileo discovered four small star-like objects around Jupiter. Having soon concluded that these were the planet's satellites or moons, he sought to establish their orbits and periods. The velocities of orbital motion decrease from the innermost to the outermost moon. All four display almost the same brightness. It was difficult, therefore, to work out which was which and calculate how long they took to complete their orbits around the planet. To determine the positions of the moons without having to perform complex calculations each time, Galileo developed a diagram, a sort of analog calculator, called the Giovelabe. The design shows Jupiter and the orbits of the four moons to scale. The orbits are placed in a grid of parallel vertical lines spaced at intervals equal to the radius of Jupiter. While making his telescopic observations, Galileo would estimate the apparent distance of a moon from a planet in units equal to Jupiter's radius. The intersection between the vertical line corresponding to this distance and the circle representing the moon's orbit, gave its position instantly. By means of a thread, one could read the value on the marked scale drawn in the margin. However, the moon's observed positions vary with the relative positions of Jupiter and the Earth in the course of their revolutions around the Sun. 
For example, the timing of a moon's passage in front of Jupiter, as seen from the Earth, differs from the timing of the same phenomenon if it were observed from the Sun. The time difference depends on the Earth-Jupiter-Sun angle, known as the annual parallax. To cancel this continuously variable effect, Galileo recorded the motion of the moons relative not to the Earth, but to the Sun. To avoid complicated calculations, he developed a second diagram consisting of a representation, to scale, of the orbits of Jupiter and the Earth around the Sun. Jupiter is assumed to be immobile at the moment of the observation. The diagram features a graduated scale giving the Earth's position relative to Jupiter. The parallax value could be read instantly on another graduated scale. The two diagrams were combined into a single instrument known as the Jovilave. Jupiter's position at the moment of observation was computed by means of a rotating disk. A moving pointer fixed with an arm to the instrument's plate served to determine the Earth's position at that same moment. The arm thus represents the Earth-Jupiter link, that is, the observer's continually changing line of sight. The parallax value for any position of the Earth relative to Jupiter could be read directly on a scale on the upper rim of the instrument. Okay, so today I uh, helped my wife change a light bulb. So, you know, I can do this kind of mechanical stuff too, right? I just thought that that was absolutely a genius device. And uh, I don't know how he had enough time to do all this stuff. Anyway, so now I mentioned that the uh, it was changed to from the Italian Science Museum to the Galileo Museum a few years ago. And that is uh, in part due to these particular artifacts. Uh, these are his bones, and at least some of them, it's just a couple. And uh, they came, uh, remember I told you he was buried in a small grave, and then in the 1700s, they moved him to that big fancy grave, big fancy tomb in the church. And when they made that move, his followers, who thought he was such a great man, uh, said, we need to keep uh, some of his bones okay and this was a very common practice especially in italy uh in the catholic church you know when someone is declared a saint uh, by the church they would frequently keep some maybe a, a possession of the person or a lock of hair or in some cases i think either some bones uh saint peter's basilica in rome is buried on the tomb of uh saint peter so those uh, um, uh, those objects from important people were kept. And that, I think, was perhaps the thinking behind doing this. Um, so in 1737, when he was reinterred, they got uh, two fingers and a, a tooth, which is kind of hard to see here. Uh, and then in 1905, they disappeared, and no one knew who they where they were for a long time. And then somehow, and I'd love to hear the story about this, they turned up in an auction in 2009, and I just, I'd love to see what they said on eBay. You know, I got Galileo's fingers here or whatever. And uh, then they, uh, the museum acquired them. They brought them in there along with some other things and it became the Galileo Museum. So, you know, I don't think there's anything to be said. The fact that this is Galileo, Galileo's middle finger. Um, I think they picked two fingers and there are many other Italian hand gestures, which we won't get into here. But this is well, but if you want to see these, doggone it, they're there at the museum, along with his tooth. So, um, uh, you know, he's not using them. So there you go. It's the Galileo Museum. Uh, oh, yeah. And I couldn't I couldn't resist the, my comment in the upper right there. May he rest in pieces. Please forgive me for that. I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. I told you a lot of telescopes. I'm walking through the museum and I see this. And I went, is this a telescope? It looks like maybe it could be, uh, but it came along after Galileo, but I had to show it because it was so bizarre and it's at the museum. And uh, as you can see in the picture on the left, it's big, okay? And so the lens was from 1690. 
Uh, it was mounted in 1767, and it was used for experiments, as it says there, on the combustion of diamonds. So in other words, they would focus the heat of the sun to burn diamonds. I have to assume that that actually worked. Uh, the purpose of doing it was to find out what they were made of. You know how scientists always want to bust things apart to find out what they're made of. And of course, what did they find? They're made of carbon, they're pure carbon, right? Uh, the experiments were, uh, again, repeated by uh, famous uh, scientist Michael Faraday in 1814. He was famous because he invented this little thing we use called the electric motor. And, um, and, and he used the same device. And then in 1860, the lens was put in the tube and was made uh, what I would call a proper telescope uh, to observe a, a stellar uh, uh, absorption spectra. So high quality lens, I suppose. And it's just so crazy. I just had a show. It was at the museum and it was crazy. So I showed it to you. Now, I mentioned very early on, Galileo, the scientist, Mr. Quantitative Science said uh, 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 that there are laws regarding falling bodies. And one of his laws is that they accelerate as they fall. And that acceleration is following mathematical laws. So there is this device that he designed, and there's no proof that he ever built it, but he designed it, he documented it. Okay, this was uh, this one that you see here was built after he was gone. Uh, so uh, the, uh, by the way, it's not the semicircular device, it's only the long triangular device with all the holes punched in it that we're gonna be talking about. So he wanted to show, you've heard the story of him dropping two cannonballs all off the Tower of Pisa to show that they hit the ground at the same time. The big one and the small one hit the ground at the same time. And he said uh, that he believed that they accelerated as they went down. But when a cannonball is falling for, I don't know, what, two, three seconds, it's really hard to measure the acceleration. So he said, you know what? You'll be able to measure the acceleration if instead of dropping them straight down, but you put them on an inclined plane, and then you'll be able to measure the acceleration quantitatively. All right. So he designed this device. So you can see the picture on the left. I'm standing next to it. It's a big thing. It's, uh, it's got to be 20, 25 feet long. I'm not exactly sure. It's an inclined plane. And he would put a ball at the top that would roll down the top of that inclined plane. And if you look closely and the, at the rightmost top of the inclined plane, there is a string hanging down with a weight a pendulum, so he could uh, uh, release the pendulum and let it go back and forth. And that was his clock. He could measure the amount of swings of the pendulum to measure time, all right? So he would drop the ball from the top and it would roll down to the bottom. <clears throat> now he wants to show that it's accelerating as it goes to the bottom. So to cut a long story sh short, the pendulum would be swinging and uh, and then in one swing of the pendulum, it would, it would move one unit of measure. But then in two swings of the pendulum, it wouldn't move two, measure, two units of measure. It would use, move four units of measure, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because it's going faster. It's accelerating. As you can see in the numbers up at the top, in one unit of time, it moves one unit of distance. One times one is one. In two units of time, it moves four units of distance, two times two. In three units of time, nine units of distance. And so as it says on the left, the distance traveled is proportional to the square of the time. So that's a mathematical formula that he discovered. All right, now, not only does he want to watch the ball, but he set up these devices that you see in the center picture. So as the ball comes through, it hits that little lever and rings a bell. So not only are you watching the ball, but you're listening to it as it gets to the specific distances that he was concerned with. So if I haven't confused you enough, it's one of the things that I do uh, is I have another video here from the museum and they uh, show you how it works. Here we go. Oh, I believe there's no sound in this. So here, this they're not trying to make you dizzy. They're just trying to show you this is how it made, okay? So they're not showing you the pendulum, but there's one unit of distance. It rings a bell, then two and four and nine, okay? So it rolls down and rings the bells as it goes down. So the ringing helps you to see what's going on. And so 
you see there's uh, four units of time, but the distances get greater each time. And therein lies his acceleration that he wanted to prove. And then I think they show your little mathematics here, one squared, two squared, three squared. And uh, so he quantitatively measured the acceleration. And uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff they put you under house arrest for, you know what I'm saying? And oh, here's the ball's eye view. I don't know why they included this. I think this is completely unnecessary, but there you go. If you were the ball, that's what you would see. All right. So I just thought that was another little piece of his genius. Again, he designed it, he described it, but did he ever build it? We're not sure. Uh, here's another thing he has invented. God, I love this. This should be in every science class in every school. All right, in, in my opinion, his thermoscope. It's a, a kind of a thermometer. All right, read the, 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 uh, the steps in what, the four steps in white on the right. For, okay, first of all, let me tell you what you got here. You got this bowl on the bottom that's halfway filled with water. And there's this tube on the left of the bowl that lets air go in, okay? Then there's a tube on the, in the center of the bowl with a cork in it, and there's a hole in the cork, all right? Then at the top, you have uh, what they would call a bulb, a glass ball uh, that, uh, that has a, a hollow tube connected to it. And that hollow tube goes through the cork and into the water that fills half of the big bowl on the bottom. You got that? You with me? Okay. Then you, he says in his description, you warm the top bulb with your hands. Okay. Now you could use a flame, I suppose, to warm it too, but he says you just warm it with your hands, which of course means you're going to warm the air inside the bulb, right? And then after, I don't know how long, a minute or two or five, you remove your hands. OK, and uh, what will happen is uh, step three. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. The two when you warm the bulb at the top, the tube is not in, inserted into the water. OK, it's it's in the cork, but it's not in the water. After you remove your hands, you lower the tube in the water. And what you watch, a miracle occurs. The water in the bottom bowl rises up into the tube. Why is that? Because he says. Warm air expands, and as it cools, it contracts, all right? Its pressure changes with temperature, and so it, the pressure is reduced when you take your hands away, and the air is cooled, and it sucks the vacuum, the, the, the change in pressure, brings the water up into the tube. And uh, he could have won bets in a bar, right? That, 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 and people would say, oh, that would never work. And then he said, oh, yeah, air pressure changes with temperature. And so... That's another thing we can, uh, it's just another little piece of his genius, okay? Uh, now, there's a ton of stuff at the museum. It's got nothing to do with Galileo, as I mentioned before, and, that is just, and it's all scientific. And I cannot, there's thousands of items there. You can spend many, many hours looking at them. Uh, it, it, this is just a couple of quick examples. Uh, obviously, you, in, the, in the upper left and lower right-hand corner, you've got astrolabes. The, the black oval on the top is, is a sundial. Um, look at the scientific instruments in the lower left. You've got the globe on the bottom with all of the constellations on it. Uh, upper right is that, that penta, penta, uh, five-sided thing. And I don't know what the heck it's for. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm sure it has an important use. Uh, th there are thousands of these items at the museum. Look at this. This globe on the left, uh, you know, we've seen those. You have Earth in the middle, and you have all these astronomical orbits, if you will, around it. I don't know what all those orbits are. I don't know if anybody does. But look at that thing. By the way, it's hard to tell, but it's about four feet in diameter, give or take. It's huge. The workmanship, absolutely astounding. Upper right-hand corner, that's a small part of their collection of microscopes. OK, lower left underneath the gold globe, a small part of their collection of watches. Again, these are many things that came after Galileo. On the right, there was a machine there with all of these, uh, a very mechanical machine. And I don't know what it does, and, but it was so beautiful. I just had to, to show you a picture of it. Uh, Italian science. And in the middle on the bottom, you have a device well, you see, you see these uh, metal spheres and the metal rings, 
And it's hard to tell, but there is a giant glass disc in the middle of it with uh, what looks like a leather uh, uh, surfaces rubbing against the disc. And you might be able to figure out that when that glass disc spins, it creates static electricity. So this was an early electrical experiment uh, in Italian science, another one of the things at the museum. Um, so uh, the last thing I want to say is, uh, 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 is to talk about Venice. Uh, at one point, uh, Venice, as it says here, uh, he took his telescope to Venice and they were so impressed with it, they made him uh, a professor at the university of there, which was a huge amount of money. He got paid to be this professor, a thousand florins, which people estimate, depending on who you listen to, between $140,000 and a million bucks a year. Okay. So he could have bought a 36 inch job, I suppose, uh, with that kind of money. Um, so why did he take his telescope to Venice? Well, besides getting that, uh, uh, getting a great job, uh, he knew there were law. Venice was a hugely rich uh, city state at the time, due to trade. Basically, they're an island uh, on the coast of Italy, and you know, trade in, in the 1600s was a huge business. And so he took the telescope there, took him up to the top of this tower, which is the bell tower in the big square, Saint Mark Square in Venice. And he took all these rich guys and, you know, when they're wearing white ermine, you know, they're rich guys. And he took them up there. He showed them his telescope and they liked the telescope because they could look out in the bay near Venice and they could see when the ships were coming in. They could see what the ships were. They could estimate when they're going to arrive. They could tell which ships were which. And, and the ships could even signal to them so they could uh, tell them, you know, the status of their trading and, and all this. The, the, the rich guys in Venice liked it so much, they gave him the, the great pension. And uh, so that happened in Venice. And on the left, you can see the view from that bell tower, the Campionelle, as they call it, <clears throat> a stunning view. So I went up there in that bell tower, and I looked out those same windows, and I thought to myself, doggone it, I am standing where Galileo showed his telescope to these people. And that, that struck me, you know? And there's people around me, and I, I didn't get the feeling that the people around me kind of knew that, but that's okay, you know. Uh, did you ever run into anybody who didn't understand your, your love of astronomy? It happens, okay. So then I went down the tower to the bottom, and this may shock you, they have a gift shop there, okay. There you go. A lot of Pinocchios. Pinocchios were huge when I was there. It, maybe it still is and always is, I don't know. But, you know, your Italian flags and all this kind of stuff. I bought my souvenir and I went to go pay for it. And on the back wall behind the cash register, almost hidden, but you could see it, was the sign you see on the right, that gray metal sign. And I saw the name Galileo on it and I, my uh, Italian was kind of weak, so I didn't know what it said. But what it said is translated on the bottom of the screen there. <clears throat> Galileo Galilei with his telescope from here, August 21, 1609. Widen the horizons of man in the fourth centenary. And the fourth centenary refers to the fact that this was in, uh, they put the plaque up there in 2009, and they're talking about his 1609, 400 years later, his observations, right? And I said, wow, somebody remembered, okay? And I was very happy to see that. Um, and, oh, and then as a little piece of trivia, if you look at that sign and you see the word on the top line, it kind of, Cano Cacciale, that's how you say telescope in Italian, in case you want to impress your Italian friends uh, in astronomy. <clears throat> so uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about the museum. Um, and there's a picture of the whole building I took. And uh, there he is, Galileo, with his telescope. I certainly do have time for questions, Joe, if you want to do that. Thank Absolutely. you, everyone, for your attention. Yeah, no, that was fantastic, Bill. Thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic presentation and uh, really appreciate the, uh, the, the time you took to put this together. And uh, every time you put one of these presentations together and give it, you know, present it to us, 
Uh, makes me want to jump on an airplane and go visit these places. But Bill, I can tell you, you certainly have a, a passion, especially for this particular museum. So thank you for sharing that with us. Well, um, you're welcome. The, the Florence uh, Chamber of Commerce will give me a percentage of your uh, whatever you spend. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. All right. Shall well, I? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask if anybody had any questions for Bill to, you know, please come off of mute and uh, feel free to ask away. I have to ask one question. So when I went there, it was before it was the Galileo Museum. I, if I remember when I went, it had the name like Museum of Medieval Scientific Instruments or something like that. It wasn't the Science Museum either. It was like, right, and right. I, and, but what I liked was the way they had Galileo's telescope mounted. If you were willing to squat next to the wall, you could sort of sight through it. Did you look through it, Galileo's telescope, or do they change them out since then? No, you're, you're right. The, the thought never crossed my mind. It was on an angle, so you could uh, squat, and you'd kind of look through it. You would you would just see the wall behind it, right. as I recall, but, but you could look light, through it. You could see some light that had gone through it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, a good idea. It gave you a strange gave me a strange look doing that but they didn't stop me <laughs> yeah yeah well you know they they do have restrictions on kind of like uh, what you can take pictures of uh oh. but uh my wife uh, my wife was my wingman and made sure that uh, i was uh, you know uh, <laughs> uh, available i was uh, safe to take pictures and you know she anyway. was the director while you were committed there you go you got to have one all the time. Yeah, That's what my parole officer so, tells me. <laughs> I did not get to photograph anywhere near as much as you did. I'm impressed. <laughs> you right. should give your wife a percent of the cut, too. I say again, please. You should give your wife a percent of your profits, too. Oh, believe me. <laughs> believe me. She gets always has gotten a percentage. All right. What other questions do we have for real? Uh, don't forget to look in the astronomy magazine, page 47. You'll see uh, his objective lens in the picture there. And Bill, you said that was the February issue, correct? Yes, that's correct. I think that just they, they do. Uh, uh, the Ed Eichler uh, talked about the, I think, the 10 or the, the 20 most important astronomers. And uh, surprise, surprise, he made Galileo number one. There you go. Okay, other questions? Well, I did. I had a question. I guess uh, I'll go ahead and ask it now. Uh, you know, the museum looks uh, fairly substantial in size. If you're making that trip, uh, is it a full day that you would want to dedicate to, to something like this, touring the entire museum? You think half a day is sufficient? Uh, what in your estimation? Um, did you budget? I would towards? say half a day could be sufficient, but there are a couple thousand items there. It all depends the you know how much time you want to spend looking at microscopes and watches and non-galilean telescopes and you know uh, electrical devices and you know that's uh, up to your personal preference yeah but you could if you go if you're really going to look at everything in detail i would say put aside a day perfect okay and bonnie Nuren and in the chat room had mentioned uh, she stood in that tower a few years ago and did not know that story. So there you go. Now you do. That's fantastic. You got to go into the gift shop behind the Pinocchios. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's nuts. There's a lot of Pinocchios. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Bill? Uh, Pradeep says he doesn't have a microphone, but he put this question in chat. I've always been curious to know in Galileo's time, how much of science was dedicated to quote astrology? Oh, it was huge. It was still absolutely huge. There's no doubt about it. You know, only weirdos like uh, Galileo was uh, the, the scientific quantitative guys. Absolutely. It was still happening. Hey, it's in the newspaper today. today. Okay. <laughs> so forget it in the 1600s. Yeah. You can probably make good money doing astrology. <laughs> I'm sure there are Don't get me of started. Miss, miss Cleo's of, of that time, right? Running around in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big deal. You know, it was Absolutely. a big deal. Today, it's uh, 
I mean, in my opinion, it's a joke in the newspaper, but then it was a big deal. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, Bill, thanks so much for the presentation. Like I said, you know, your, your passion for uh, this has is, is certainly come through and uh, really appreciate you sharing all the photos and the stories and everything else. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, get past the pandemic sooner rather than later and, and travel really yeah. up and love to, to make a visit to this museum. So thank you so much for sharing this and, and all the other presentations you've shared with us uh, about your travels. So, You're welcome. Uh, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. Okay. All right. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll stop sharing. I'll stop sharing. Oh, you did that. I, I think, oh. yeah, I was able to get it. So, um, again, appreciate everybody joining us tonight, uh, helping us work through this pandemic, knowing that uh, we'd originally intended to have a, a hybrid meeting, but went online only. Um, lots of events already in the calendar for January. So go ahead and take a look at what's uh, going on there in the events section of our website. And uh, our February meetings are coming up next month on Thursday, February 3rd, as Debbie had mentioned. We're going to have a talk by Rene Gadeli about the Messiers and the Messier Marathon. And our general meeting is going to be Friday, February 4th. So we're still monitoring the situation to figure out whether or not we're going to do a virtual only or uh, we'll, if we'll have a hybrid meeting uh, there at the Mendenhall Center and online through Zoom. So uh, if you have any questions, by all means, send us an email, info at astronomyhouston.org. Our social media platforms are listed there below. Feel free to give us a follow. And our website that we're in the process of uh, migrating and hopefully will be done soon is there at uh, astronomyhouston.org. So until next time, I appreciate you joining us. Stay safe and we'll see you then. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. So long. Thank you. Thank you.